In 1859, when the Austrians abandoned the city of Milan, the square in front of the Duomo looked like this, with a block of tenements called the Rebecchino on the left and the Coperto dei Figini on the right. In the following year, the first municipal council took office, led by the mayor, Antonio Beretta. The facade of the Duomo had been finally completed after decades of uncertainty, and the city administrators were determined to celebrate the reunification of Italy by creating a monumental square worthy of the cathedral. The plans envisaged the demolition of the Rebecchino, and of the Coperto dei Figini, as well as the creation of a road connecting the new square to the theatre La Scala, cutting through an old area of the city that was going to be demolished in order to make room for new buildings. The Coperto dei Figini had been built by Pietro Figino in 1456 on a project of architect Solari. It rose where the nave of the ancient church of Santa Tecla was stood. It was the last surviving arcaded building of the city. Inside it, many shops and stores thrived. Some of them later moved to the gallery. As we can see in this painting by Angelo Inganni, this building had been heavily remodeled at the end of the 18th century by adding balconies and decorations. Maybe because of these works it became necessary to reinforce it with wooden beams, as it can be seen in this old photograph of Piazza Duomo and in a drawing published by the satirical newspaper La Cicala Politica. The part towards the Duomo was the first one to be demolished, with the exception of the shops covered by a wide terrace. The project for a new road between Piazza del Duomo and the Theatre La Scala, which since 1858 had a new square in front of it, entailed the destruction of an ancient district consisting of a dense network of popular tenements, narrow streets and courtyards. Here, in the Contrada dei Due Muri, the street of the two walls, the ancient church of San Salvatore once stood, together with the Zenodocium, the oldest orphanage of Milano, commissioned by Datheus, the archpriest of Santa Maria Maggiore, one of the two churches that once rose where the Duomo Square now is. In the year 787, Datheus devised the creation of an orphanage for the abandoned children of the city. The Senodocium remained active at least until 1456, when the charitable institutions of the city were centralized in the Ospedale Maggiore at the Cagranda. The first documents mentioning San Salvatore date back to 1300. Two centuries later, Francesco Maria Ricchini rebuilt this church as a single nave one with two chapels on each side. Suppressed in 1787, the church was demolished in 1808. Its place was taken by the Teatro Re, designed by architect Cagnola, which became the most famous pros theatre of the city. When the theatre was demolished, in 1872, to make room for the gallery, its activities were taken over by the new Teatro della Commedia, later renamed Teatro Manzoni, in Piazza San Fedele. Also, the Church of Santa Margherita, with the adjoining monastery, belonged to that ancient district. Founded in 912, it was originally dedicated to Santa Maria, called Del Gisone, or Gisone, after the name of the founder. Among the nuns who lived in the convent stands the name of Caterina Brugora. Belonging to a noble family of Milan, she entered the nunnery in 1498 and became famous for her holy life. The people attributed to her the gift of prophecy and thought that she carried on her body the signs of the wounds and of the crown of thorns of the Christ. In 1781, the convent was suppressed and the building was used until 1866 as headquarters of the police and as a prison. Among the last inmates was Silvio Pellico, author of the famous book of memoir, My Prisons. 
The demolitions concern the area where the rectory of the decuments once was, housing the twelve canons of the old church of Santa Tecla. It overlooked the so-called Stretta dei Decumani, a dead-end alley located where Via Foscolo today is. In the alley there was a porticated building with arcades on the upper floor, stables and a well. The rectory was probably connected with a room above the portico of the church, called Palatium, and used by the canons for their offices. This connection is indicated by the two arches that rose at the beginning of the Contrada dei Due Muri, maybe the remains of an ancient road that can be seen in the plan of the Theresian Land Registry. With the demolition of Santa Tecla, the buildings were subsequently used as customs offices or Dazio Grande until, in 1781, under the Austrian administration, the customs offices were transferred to Palazzo Marino. In this area was also the Osteria del Dazio Grande. Its building later became the Hotel Duomo. For the construction of the gallery, the Albergo del Marino was also sacrificed. It rose on the road with the same name, right in front of Palazzo Marino. The building dated back to the 16th century. In the courtyard, on the first floor, the walls of the loggia had been frescoed by Bernardino Lanino. Among the famous guests of the hotel were Madame de Stal and Giuseppe Garibaldi, who stopped there on his way to Bergamo, where he recruited the volunteers for his military expedition to Sicily. With two decrees, dated January 24th and February 2nd, 1860, King Vittorio Emanuele II authorized the expropriations of the area concerned by the project and the demolition of the buildings. The first lots were those between the Theatre La Scala and the Contrada dei Due Muri. In 1866, the Coperto dei Figini was pulled down. The Rebecchino was demolished following years of legal battles only in 1875, when, on occasion of a visit of Kaiser Wilhelm I, the area was razed within a week by an army of laborers. In 1859, the king had authorized the municipality to issue a lottery with two million tickets sold at ten lire each to cover the costs for expanding and embellishing Piazza del Duomo. The amount raised was insufficient and the municipality requested a loan to a syndicate of ten banks. A call for ideas was launched on April 1860, open to all citizens. It provided the basis for the guidelines of a second call, launched in May 1861, this time open only to architects. The guidelines of the project were the connection to Piazza della Scala and the widening of Piazza del Duomo, as well as the reconstruction of the buildings overlooking it. None of the 18 architects who had joined the contest won, but four projects were rewarded, and in particular that of Giuseppe Mengoni earned a honorable mention. In 1863, a final competition by invitation was held. Apart from Giuseppe Mengoni, also architect Giuseppe Pestagalli, professor at the Brera Academy, and architect Niccolò Matas were invited, but Matas withdrew from the competition due to other commitments. Mengoni's project won. It foresaw the construction of a covered street with an octagonal square in the middle. In September 1863, the project received the approval of the City Council, and in 1864 it was ratified with some substantial changes. A transverse axis was added, which intersected the main axis at the octagonal square. The exit towards Piazza Scala was redesigned, and two more floors were added to the original four, the second of them above the roof vaults of the gallery in order to increase the profitability of the buildings. Compared to other European galleries built at the beginning of the 19th century, the Gallery Vittorio Emanuele was much larger. It was a type of construction that seemed out of fashion. In the project of Mengoni, real buildings overlooked two streets covered with large glass and steel vaults. In this drawing we can see the Gallery of Milan compared to other glazed shopping arcades such as the Passage de Panorama 
built in 1800 in Paris, the Galerie d'Orléans, built in 1829 also in Paris, where an arch roof was adopted for the first time, the Galleria de Cristoforis, built in 1832 in Milan on a project by architect Andrea Pizzala, and the Galerie Saint-Hubert, built in 1847 in Brussels, which marked the final abandonment of the pitched roof. The very ambitious project was to be financed by an English company, the City of Milan Improvements Company Limited, established in London on December 20, 1864. They had to contract the work and own the tenements in the gallery, while the passageways would belong to the municipality. On January 11, 1865, the construction contract between the company and the municipality of Milan was signed. On March 7, the groundbreaking ceremony took place in the octagonal area created between the buildings being demolished in what would become the centre of the gallery in the presence of King Vittorio Emanuele II. Wooden steps and a canopy pavilion had been erected for the ceremony. In a grey and snowy day, as shown in this painting by Domenico Induno, a leaden box containing the project drawings and the documents of the ceremony was placed into a granite boulder and sealed with a stone, dropped at the cutting of the ribbon. Mengoni handed the silver trowel to the monarch, who sealed everything with cement. The boulder became part of one of the foundation pillars of the gallery. Within 1866, the basic structures of the buildings had been completed, starting from those near to Piazza Scala. In 1867, the most challenging part of the project began, the construction of the iron and glass structure, which lasted almost five months. The glazing structure covering the gallery was mainly composed of four barrel vaults for the four wings of the gallery and by a hemispherical dome with a diameter of 39 meters which crowned the central octagonal square. The vaults were 14.94 meters wide each but they had different lengths according to the wings they covered. The eastern and western wings were both 31 0.09 meters long. The north wing had a length of 71.12 meters and the south wing a length of 64.7 meters. The metal structure consisted of a series of transversal arches in wrought iron which had been pre-assembled using six curved segments. These had an eye section and were perforated with geometric motifs. Those connected to the dome were double, as they had to bear part of its weight. They were joined longitudinally by five purlins per span. The purlins at the top were thinner, since the central part of each vault had no glazing. It was instead covered by a lantern running above it and allowing the ventilation of the spaces below. The arches of the vaults stepped onto consoles made of cast iron. Part of each console was integrated into the masonry of a building, while the protruding part was decorated. The console transferred the lateral thrusts of the vault arch to a peripheral system of wrought iron beams. The bottom flange of each console had circular openings for four anchoring bolts, which secured a rigid attachment to a granite block topping the supporting masonry. The integrating system was designed by Girolamo Kizzolini, head of the Construction Works Department. The construction contract prohibited the adoption of horizontal tie rods to contain the lateral thrusts of the roof. Therefore, an integrating system was devised made of wrought iron beams and ties. Granite blocks topped the masonry walls under the feet of the arches and distributed the load to the supporting brick pilasters. 
As the temperature varied, the arches could only expand upwards as their feet had been firmly anchored to the masonry. The construction combined different materials into a hybrid between traditional construction techniques and modern iron architecture. It also allowed to replace, in the premises intended for commercial activities, the load-bearing walls with less invasive cast-iron pillars on which the steel beams rested which supported the rooms above. The pitch roof of the lanterns was supported by X-section columns bolted to the vaults underneath at the intersections between arches and purlins. A structure of crosswire rafters and lengthwise purlins supported the glazing. Bolted decorative knees contributed to stiffen the lanterns. The dome structure was elevated 30.15 meters from the pavement and its height reached 12.35 meters, excluding the cupolino on top of it. Its framework consisted of 16 wrought iron arches obtained by pre-assembling six curved segments with an eye profile and perforated with geometric motifs mounted as if they were meridians. Since the dome had to cover an octagonal space, the meridians at the eight corners of the octagon were longer. They were supported by cast iron shoes partly incorporated into the masonry and partly hidden behind decorative sculptures of eagles. Those shoes also supported the loads of the double arches at the end of the vaults and those of the blind arches along the side of the octagon. Four meridians were placed in correspondence of the four masonry walls of the octagon. Their feet were attached to a cast iron shoe carried on a pair of transverse beams connected to the integrating system. Thus, any lateral thrust due to expansion or contraction of the meridians was transferred to the surrounding buildings. Four shorter meridians stepped directly onto the vault arches by means of appropriately shaped cast iron wedges. All meridians were braced laterally with parallel wrought iron rings perforated with geometric patterns and assembled on the side. Their thickness decreased from the bottom upwards as did the resistance requirement. The dome was surmounted by a cupolino consisting of a cylindrical wrought iron body of 10 meters in diameter and 5 or 25 meters in height, surmounted by a cone-shaped glazed roof. It allowed the ventilation of the octagon below. The cylindrical body consisted mainly of eight small wrought iron columns in correspondence with the eight meridians springing from the corners of the octagon. Each column had a cast iron shoe with a strap at its base, bolted to the ring of the upper dome. The glass roof was supported by eight rafters, braced by purlins on four levels. The flat rib glass plates were supplied by Saint-Gobain and were laid so that each overlapped the previous one. They had all a thickness of 6 mm and a width of 60 cm, while the length varied according to their locations, with two lengths prevalent 88 and 170 cm. The roof had a service corridor running along the perimeter of the vaults and the dome, used to collect the snow swept by the maintenance workers. The snow was then thrown into the courtyards of adjacent buildings. The service corridor also gave access to the vaults. A system of boardwalks and stairs, some fixed, some sliding on rails, gave access to the glazing and allowed to carry out the maintenance. Dome boardwalks were developed at three levels. The upmost ring ran at the base of the cupolino, accessible via two inclined stairs. All wrought and cast iron components had been produced by Henri Jorette's Paris-based firm, specialized in metal constructions and older of patents for bridges and walk ways, canopies for covered markets and stations, the metal pieces for a total 
of 350,000 kilos arrived from France by train. They were used to cover an area of 6,250 square meters. Once the roof was built, the interior decoration was carried out in the cheapest and fastest possible way because the commercial spaces had to be open as soon as possible due to the costs of the project. Freestone was used for the plinth of the facades in pink granite of Baveno. The Vichu stone was employed for the pedestals and the outlines of the half pilasters, as well as for window frames and balcony corbels. The Vicenza stone was used for part of the entablature. For the decorations, stucco and terracotta were used, applying colors that simulated natural stone. The terracottas were produced by the Milanese firm Andrea Boni, which also decorated the Manzoni house and the Chani house, the famous Red House. Around the entire perimeter of the gallery ran a balcony. In the railings are 104 coats of arms of Italian cities. The gallery floor was made of slabs of granite, Bartiglio and Verona red, and entirely decorated with marble and enamel mosaics. On four sides of the octagon floor are the coats of arms of Milan, of the former capital cities of Turin and Florence, and of Rome, then about to become the new capital of Italy. In the centre was the coat of arms of the House of Savoy. In the octagon and along the side entrances, 24 plaster statues of famous Italians had been placed on shelves to celebrate the virtues of the recently reunified nation. They were meant to be replaced with marble statues, but these were never sculpted, and the plaster statues, which had rapidly deteriorated, were eventually removed. The decorations of the lunettes of the dome celebrate the four continents. Europe was commissioned to the painter Angelo Pietrasanta, America to Raffaele Casnedi, Asia to Bartolomeo Giuliano, and Africa to Eleuterio Pagliano. Human activities were depicted in the lunettes of the side wings. On the side towards Via Ugo Foscolo, art was painted by Raffaele Casnedi and agriculture by Eleuterio Pagliano. On the side towards Via Silvio Pellico, industry was painted by Bartolomeo Giuliano and science by Angelo Pietrasanta. All these paintings deteriorated rapidly. Therefore, in 1912, they were replaced with mosaics realized by Alessandro Dal Prat of the famous firm Salviati of Venice. He used as models smaller reproductions of the original paintings made by Osvaldo Bignami. They have been preserved at Palazzo Morando. The gallery was gas lit. The lamps under the dome were lit by means of a spring-loaded device, nicknamed the Little Mouse by the Milanese, which, equipped with a burning pad, ran on rails along the perimeter of the octagon. It remained in operation for about 20 years, until 1883, when the gas lighting of the octagon was replaced by the electricity produced in the Edison plant of a street nearby, via Santa Radigonda. The gallery, which was still missing its large entrance arch, was inaugurated on September 15, 1867. Greeted by the enthusiastic applause of people filling windows and balconies, King Vittorio Emanuele II reached the octagon and there the deed of inauguration was stipulated on a table. At 2 p.m. the gallery was finally open to the public who walked along it from Piazza Scala to Piazza Duomo. In that year, a cholera epidemic was raging in Italy. In July, the mayor Beretta resigned accused of having paid an excessive compensation to one of his councillors for the expropriation of a building to be demolished to make room for the gallery. In the meantime, the London-based contractor faced financial difficulties and had to suspend the works. 
In 1869, the City of Milan Improvements Company Limited was forced to sell the gallery for 7,300,000 lire to the municipality of Milan, who took over the project. Mengoni was appointed artistic director, while Girolamo Kizzolini assumed the direction of the works. In 1870, the works were resumed, and five years later, the northern and southern buildings of Piazza Duomo were completed. However, the works for the construction of the triumphal arch were lagging behind, and the municipality decided to stipulate a lump sum contract for 710,000 lire with Mengoni himself, who assumed the responsibility as private entrepreneur to complete the works before 1877. Meanwhile, in June of 1874, a hailstorm had shattered 7,000 glass panes in the gallery and they had to be replaced, which reinforced the polemics about the maintenance costs that such a building carried. On December 30, 1877, on the eve of the final completion date, Giuseppe Mengoni, who had climbed on the scaffolding for a last inspection, stumbled and fell to his death. The arch was inaugurated on February 24, 1878, without celebrations, because King Victoria Emanuele II had died as well in January. The project of Mengoni for Piazza Duomo was not completed. The monumental palace that had to close the square was eventually not built, nor was built a second arch, aligned with the entrance to the gallery on the opposite side of the square to replace the so-called long sleeve of the royal palace. In 1936, the long sleeve was eventually demolished to make room for the new building of the Arengario, a bronze quadriga that should have dominated the square from the top of the arch of the gallery was also not realized. It was replaced in 1987 by the instrument of the Meteorological Observatory of Milan, in a room obtained in the attic, in 1932 the power station for the regulation of the city public's clocks was installed. But let's now have a look at the shops that were in the gallery, according to the Savallo guidebook of 1881, more than a decade after the inauguration. At the corner with the arcades of Piazza Duomo was the famous Café Campari, managed by Gaspare Campari, the inventor of the Fernet and of the bitter in the Dutch style, as people used to say back then. Upstairs was his home, where his son, Davide, was born in 1867. The first child born in the gallery. In 1915, Davide will open a cafe on the opposite side, the famous Camparino, which still exists with its beautiful decor. On the wing of the gallery towards Via Ugo Foscolo was the Stocker Beer Hall in premises that had once belonged to the Caffè Gnocchi. There, beautiful waitresses in Tyrolean costume greeted the clients. In 1885, the property passed to Virginio Savini, who opened there his luxurious cafe restaurant, which will become the center of Milan's social life. Another historic cafe was opened in 1867 by Paolo Biffi, the confectioner of His Majesty the King, specialized in the production of the panettone. It occupied the shop windows in the octagon and those on the wing towards the Ugo Fosco. The restaurant still exists, but is now in the wing towards Piazza Duomo. In 1876, Baldassare Gnocchi had moved his cafe to the wing towards Piazza Scala. Here you could eat, drink and spend your evenings by listening to the concerts performed by an orchestra entirely composed of female musicians from Vienna. Two years later, this café took the name of Beer Hall Gambrinus from the name of a mythical figure to whom some legends attribute the invention of the beer brewed with malt and hops. It expanded so as to occupy nine windows. 
1915, with the entry of Italy into World War I, the beer hall was renamed Grand Italia and survived until the second post-war period. The Gambarinus was also famous because on August 21st, 1880, it was the first bar of Milan to be lit by electricity, thanks to four lamps supplied by the German company Siemens and Halsk. That was three years before electrical lighting spread to the rest of the city. At the inauguration, the gallery housed 96 shops. Some of them had moved there from the Coperto dei Figini, such as Flander and Frere, dealing in fans and fancy goods, such as those selling furs, or those of tailors and of clock sellers. The Fambelotti sold gloves made with the Jouvent system from the name of a glove manufacturer of Grenoble who had patented the so-called iron hand, a cutting die allowing a precise cut of the leather. In the octagon there were two large stores for drapery, that of Domenico Marliani and that of the firm Cozzi. The remaining shop windows in the octagon belonged to the music publisher Ricordi. In addition to jewelers and clock sellers, one could find the shop of the optician scientist Alessandro Duroni, who made the first daguerreotypes in Milan. In his shop, he sold physics and chemistry instruments and equipment for the daguerreotype photographic process. Some shops sold art objects, such as that of Paolo Vercesi, representing the famous firm Salviati of Venice, specialized in art objects and Murano glass, which had created the mosaics of the gallery's octagon, or such as the firm Andrea Boni, whose works in terracotta decorated many facades of Milan. There were corsetry stores, knitwear stores, tobacconists and pipe shops like that of Giacomo Goldfinger selling a large assortment of foam pipes. There were the historic Maglia stationery store and the Carlo Erba pharmacy, the offices of newspapers, of money changers and commercial agents, head sellers and clothing stores for children. There were perfumeries and travel goods shops, and also that of the taxidermist Enrico Bonomi, who worked for the House of Savoy, but also for artists such as Tranquillo Cremona, to whom he had supplied the falcon used for the painting The Falconer. There was a studio of Eleuterio Pagliano, author of the painting representing Africa in the octagon. There were shops for paintings and art prints, as well as pastry and liquor shops. Today, more than a century later, only the Savini Café Restaurant and the Biffy have survived and the gallery has become, above all, a prestigious showcase for the big fashion brands attracted by the increasing appeal of Milan as tourist destination. The damages of the air raids in 1943 are only a sad memory and the last restoration of the gallery on the occasion of the Universal Exposition of 2015 have returned to the city, a public lounge of remarkable beauty. With the construction of the gallery and the widening of Piazza Duomo, Milano embarked on a one-way road by bringing into the very heart of the city a change of scale regarding the size of the buildings. From then on, the old historic centre appeared inadequate for the city's ambitions. Within a few decades, the face of Milan will be transformed by new streets and monumental buildings. The city of business will replace the old city of the small shops and many people will gradually move into outlying areas. For his project, Mengoni was inspired by the case of the Garibaldi in Genoa, which he reproduced with his eclecticism in the buildings of the gallery, a taste far from the one typical of Milan. He showed audacity in the design of such a large iron structure when experience in this field was still limited, exposing himself to inevitable criticism. He overcame huge challenges, although, unfortunately, he didn't live enough to enjoy his triumph. Eventually, the gallery was unanimously appreciated and it is still admired all over the world. This was not always the case for other buildings on Piazza Duomo. The monumental arch seemed almost immediately excessive as an entrance to a commercial gallery. With its dimensions and decoration, 
it seemed to reduce the impact of the facade of the Duomo. Luckily, the arch was not replicated on the opposite side of the square, although also the building that rose there, the Arengario, has also attracted some criticism. Also, the arcades on Piazza Duomo appear too high, and the succession of identical arcades and windows was perceived as dull. The edifice intended for closing the square on the opposite side of the Duomo was never built. On that side, only the unpretentious building of Palazzo Carminati stands, interrupting the effect of continuity of the facades. With the creation of the gallery, the city of Milan has looked ahead, ready also to devour itself in order to keep up with the times. The city chose to project an image suited to its role of economic capital of the country.